Hello again and welcome back to the Lean Six Sigma Master Series in the Demaic Analyze phase. Now in this module, module two, and the next module three, you and I will be looking at what I've called a hypothesis testing overview. Now these next two modules are just that. It's to introduce you to the concept of hypothesis testing. Why? Well, over the remaining modules of the analyze phase, time and again, you and I will be looking at ways of carrying out hypothesis testing. And although a fairly straightforward concept, it can be easily glossed over and not fully understood what it actually is and why we'd want to use it. So before we get into the specific analysis techniques that you would use, these first two slides will introduce the topic to you so that you'll have a basic understanding. So when we get more specific in later modules, you'll be quite clear on what hypothesis testing actually is. All right, that's a long introduction for a fairly straightforward topic, so let's make a start right away. First and most obviously, why would you want to do hypothesis testing? Let's start with the definition of the word hypothesis. It is a proposed explanation for a phenomenon that needs to be tested. So a hypothesis is merely a proposition and its main purpose within Lean Six Sigma is that in order to improve processes, there is a need to identify the X's, remember that you covered that in the previous module, which impact the mean or standard deviation of a population of data. So when identified and adjustments are made for improvement, actual improvement needs to be validated. So yes, it's one thing tweaking your process, but has it really made any difference? So sometimes it cannot be decided graphically or by using calculated statistics to determine whether or not there is a statistically significant, there's an important term, difference between the processes, that is before and after. And in such cases, the decision therefore will be subjective and you'll want to perform a formal statistical hypothesis test to decide objectively if indeed there is a difference. So a hypothesis test is nothing more than a set of statistical tools that quantifies your confidence about the real difference based on the measurements. So it's a method of making a statistical decision using experimental data and therefore is also called statistical significance testing. Yes, a lot of grand words here, but bear in mind this is fairly fundamental and very important. So hypothesis testing gives objective answers to questions which are often answered subjectively. You'll learn more of that as we proceed. So how exactly does hypothesis work? Well, there are two things, what's known as a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Stay with me. So a null hypothesis is a theory, remember it's a proposition, based on insufficient evidence that requires further testing to prove whether the observed data is true or false. Now that's a very important first statement for you to understand. It's what you first state, even though we don't yet have any real evidence. And certainly having captured and stated it, we'll then need testing to prove whether that observed data is right or wrong in effect. For example, a null hypothesis statement can be, the rate of plant growth is not affected by sunlight. I think you and I both know instinctively the answer to that, but it's a good example, isn't it? Suppose you are involved in an experiment to determine whether that was true or not. So it can be tested, of course, by measuring the growth of plants in the presence of sunlight, and then comparing it with the growth of the same plants or same species at least, in the absence of sunlight and seeing whether the rate of growth is different. That's what we mean by tested. So rejecting the null hypothesis sets the stage for further experimentation to see if a relationship between the two variables exists. In this case, plant growth and sunlight. So not only that, rejecting the null hypothesis does not necessarily mean that the experiment did not produce the required results, but merely it would lead to further experimentation. Got the idea? So what's known as a significance test is used to establish confidence in a null hypothesis, which is really a statement as you've learned, and to determine whether the observed data is not due to chance 
or manipulation of data. And that also is a vitally important point. You see, let me see if I can come up with a rather simplistic example. This idea of the rate of plant growth is not affected by sunlight. What if you grew some indoors and some outdoors, but you put them in the shade and there wasn't any difference? So we need therefore a significance test to be absolutely sure that we know whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. So the hypothesis is tested by examining a random sample of the plants being grown, both those with the sunlight and without the sunlight. Suppose you had 100 plants indoors and 100 plants outdoors in the sun. Well, of course, you could look at all of them, but what you might want to do, just take a sample of 20 in the sunlight and a sample of 20 indoors and see whether there's a significant difference. That's why you need a significance test. You see, it's not just as simple as saying, I counted them and there's more plants that got a little bit higher in the sun than those without. Again, thinking about due to chance, it might be the, the days in which you measured this. It might be that the days during which this experiment was taking place, they were very overcast days. So if the outcome demonstrates, is that word again, a statistically significant change in the observed change, in this case of plants, then the null hypothesis is rejected. See, here's the null hypothesis. We are proposing that the rate of plant growth is not affected by sunlight. But if having done the measurement and you find that it's statistically significant, you'll need to know what that means, and I'll be explaining that shortly, then the null hypothesis is rejected. It's not true. In other words, we're saying that's wrong. We've just found out that plant growth can be affected by sunlight. Got the idea? Stay with me. So let's now just talk about statistical significance. Just be aware that we've got 33 modules in the analyze phase. And over those modules, I'll be giving you all of the formula, if you will, and techniques to actually calculate statistical significance. But for now, just take it as this, that statistical significance is a determination by analysis that the results in the data, the before and the after in the case of those plants, are not explainable by chance alone, as I said in the previous slide. So statistical hypothesis testing is the analysis method used to make such a determination. And here we are. There's something called a probability value or p-value. And this value describes how likely, probability if you will, it is your data occurred by random chance, i.e. that the null hypothesis is true. And what we mean here by random chance is that the data wasn't manipulated in some way. Now this so-called p-value will be a number between 0 and 1, or 0% and 100% if you will. And I'll be showing you the p-values as a decimal fraction, as well as a percentage, for good reason, as you'll see. So the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence that you should reject the null hypothesis. And of course, therefore, if we do indeed reject the null hypothesis, then ergo, we must accept the alternate hypothesis. You'll understand that more fully in a moment. Here's a diagram which you are familiar with, the standard bell-shaped curve. And you'll remember when I introduced this way back, if memory serves in Lean Six Sigma fundamentals, I talked about a craftsman being given bars of aluminium and cutting them into 10 inch lengths. And then at the end of the day, we examined all of those bars that he created. In fact, we measured their lengths. Because the craftsman would want to do this with care and thought and try to get as close as possible to 10 inches, we would expect that the bulk of them would be quite close to 10 inches. However, some of them, for whatever reason, might be a little shorter or a bit longer. And one or two would have to be just thrown away. Perhaps he misread the measurement device and cut it to 9 inches instead. Just an accident or a mistake, if you will. Nonetheless, going back to our natural bell-shaped curve here, you'd expect most of them to be in the middle portion. And as you got further out, you would find the error was getting worse and worse. And perhaps the ones I've shown in red here were the ones you'd have to reject. So this is measuring the probability of observations. We're saying that if the craftsman knew what he was doing, he was familiar with the tools used, the tools were calibrated, and the total environment was fairly stable, we'd expect to have the bulk of them in the middle. Much more here of these 10 inch bars than the few at the extremes. Got the idea? This shows the whole set of possible results. 
You may also remember that we talked about in Six Sigma, we'd normally use 95% as our measurement point, meaning 5% falls outside that. So a p-value of 5% or lower is statistically significant. In other words, we want to include it. And indicating less than a 5% probability, then the null hypothesis is correct and the results are random. And don't forget that an alternate hypothesis and a null hypothesis are mutually exclusive, so that only one of the two hypotheses can be true. Our job, using statistical significance as one of the tools here, and the hypothesis technique is to determine which one is true. So statistical significance is a determination about the null hypothesis, which suggests that the results are due to chance alone and not some interference. In effect, we're looking at cause versus effect. Again, I'm reminding you of p-values between zero and one. And the idea with the null hypothesis is that we would believe this until proved otherwise, much like in a trial where the jury would be informed by the judge the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. So the rejection of the null hypothesis is needed for the data to be deemed statistically significant. And you'll see why that occurs at or near that 5% border that I suggested in the previous slide. Let's be clear then, HO, which is the normal symbol for null hypothesis, is a statement of no effect or difference, or if you will, the status quo. Whereas the alternative hypothesis, known as H small a, is that the statement acclaimed is assumed to be true. So null says no effect or no difference, and HA therefore is where you assume that to be true. So let's just show you an example just based on this generic curve here. So if your p-value is greater than 0.05, that's your 5%, we have failed to reject the null hypothesis. I'll give you a very simple example in a moment. Whereas if the p-value is less or equal to 0.05, then the null hypothesis will be rejected. See the idea? So in one case, we fail to reject it, and in the other, we actually reject it. A nice way of remembering this is that if P is low, HO must go. I'm sure you're still getting your head around what all this means, but stay with me. As I say, we'll be doing a lot of work on this throughout the remaining modules. And my objective at the end of the next two modules is you've got a fairly reasonable understanding of what this is all about. Carrying on, hypothesis testing is done to help determine if the variation between or among groups of data is due to true variation or whether it is a result of sample variation. Now, with the help of sample data, we form assumptions about the population. Then we have to test, of course, our assumptions statistically. Here's HO again, null hypothesis, statement of no effect or no difference. Whereas HA, alternative hypothesis, statement or claim to be true. And we are trying to prove it to be true so that the burden of proof rests with the alternate hypothesis. So the alternate hypothesis is the statement which stands true if the null hypothesis is rejected. In other words, with two statements, if one of them is rejected, the other must stand as the truth. So a null hypothesis can only be rejected or fail to be rejected. You cannot accept the null hypothesis just due to lack of evidence to reject it. Again, that's a very important phrase. Let's read it again. A null hypothesis can only be rejected or fail to be rejected. That's it. You either reject it or, no, nope, we haven't got sufficient information to reject it. It cannot be accepted simply because you haven't gathered enough evidence to reject it. So we assume that the null hypothesis is true unless proven otherwise. Here's that again. Your rule of thumb, therefore, is if P is less or equal to 0.05, the null hypothesis will be rejected. Whereas if P is greater than 0.05, your 5%, if you remember, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So therefore, it's only if it's less than 5%. If P is low, HO must go. And you're left, therefore, with the alternate hypothesis, or HA. Very good. There's a good place to pause 
If the term and use of hypothesis is new to you, grab yourself a strong cup of coffee, but do join me in the second and final part of my hypothesis testing overview. So until we meet up again, from me, Dave, it's bye for now.